Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, a church located on the traditional homelands of the Cayuga Nation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Welcome to you if you are male or female, or a little bit of each, queer or straight, or a little bit of each, black or brown or white, or a little bit of each, old or young, or a little bit of each, rich or poor, or a little bit of each, doubting or believing, or a little bit of each. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're always welcome here. A few announcements to share. The flowers you see on the communion table this morning have been donated by the family of Walt Wheatgriff. The graveside service to remember his life was yesterday. Blessings to his family and especially to Joanne. Joanne actually made the stole that I'm wearing this morning, um, so it's near and dear to my heart. And I mean that literally because she sewed a Yankee symbol right here on the inside flap. Uh, congratulations to our high school graduating youth. Uh, you're graduating this month, and we want to congratulate you. You can read the names of the youth who are gradu graduating on page two of the bulletin. The UCC's General Synod begins on July 11th. Our very own Sophie Bosworth Viscuzo will be a New York Conference delegate to Synod this year. Uh, Synod will be a virtual event, so any UCC member can join in. And you can look for more information about how to join in this upcoming week's emails from the church office. Also, this week we will be launching a caring survey as part of our strategic planning initiative. The survey is designed to check in on all of you as we emerge from the pandemic and also to see how we can continue to meet your caring needs. So look for more information about this survey in upcoming emails from the church office. An announcement from the Outreach Action Group for the month of June's Mind, Body, Soul theme. We are putting the spotlight on the Mental Health Association in Tompkins County. Their mission includes working toward empowering individuals, families, and groups through advocacy and the provision of, provision of services which promote mental health and educating and providing information to the general public about mental health issues. They offer a variety of programs to support people of all ages. So please consider a donation in any amount to the Mental Health Association, and you can give directly on their website and the link was included in Friday's email from the church office. And related to this, please join today's Afterword at 11.15 with Pat Vincent of the Mental Health Association. She will be talking about some of the services they offer and the creative ways they have worked to support individuals and families during the pandemic. The Zoom link to join that Afterword was also sent out on Friday. And finally, please join our church's email listserv. Over the summer, we're going to be sending out our Highland highlights only twice a month and using the listserv more frequently for church announcements and updates. To join the listserv, you can send an email to the church office, office at fccithica.org. And now please rise as you are able, and those tuning in on live stream, lift your hearts and join in the responsive call to worship. God welcomes and loves us. As people gathered in God's love, we celebrate God's presence and declare that each one of us has been shaped and formed by God. We are all God's children. Each one of us is precious and beloved.
Please join me in the opening prayer. O oh God, maker of all that is beautiful, Jesus gave us the seeds of your justice and peace. Touch us, teach us, inspire us to sow those seeds through our ministries so that all may share in love's abundance and make true the promise that no one will know exclusion in this community and beyond. Amen. As we greet each other this morning, feel free to wave or flash a peace sign or a holy elbow bump. And the live streamers are tuning in on that camera back there so we can greet them as well. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please be seated. The first reading is Psalm 20. I invite you to listen for the very positive verbs that are shot all through this. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your victory and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariot, chariots and some in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall stand and rise and stand upright. Give victory to the King, O Lord, and answer us when we call. And from 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 17 through 19. So, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. And the gospel is from Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 32, two parables about seeds. Jesus also said the kingdom of God is is. As, as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. 
Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Please join me in prayer. Put a hand on our shoulder and point us in the right direction. Put our hand on someone's shoulder and let it matter. Amen. On Tuesday, Smithsonian Magazine ran a story about the history of the rainbow flag titled, Where Did the Rainbow Flag Come From Anyway? It's a similar question to the one journalist Hillary Greenbaum asked 10 years ago this month. Who made that rainbow flag, she asked. There's a long history of rainbow flags being flown to symbolize things like peace and political movements. 16th century Protestant reformer Thomas Munzer is even portrayed in art with a rainbow flag to symbolize his solidarity with German peasants. But Hillary Greenbaum was asking specifically about the multicolored pride flag, what she called the, quote, instantly recognizable symbol of diversity and acceptance. The same flag waved at pride parades and hung outside houses and churches and businesses in town, the colors of which we can see today in our sanctuary. The biblical character Noah, wrote Greenbaum, considered the rainbow to be a sign from God. Aristotle wrestled with the rainbow's geometry, and Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz sang about the rainbow as an escape from Kansas. But who turned the rainbow into a flag symbolizing diversity and acceptance, she asked. The answer is Gilbert Baker, an artist who passed away in 2017. Baker was living in San Francisco in 1978 when he first created the flag. He said in an interview, I became keenly aware of flags because of the bicentennial in 1976 and this huge wave of American flags that just washed over the country. And I really started looking at flags with a new eye, he said. And I thought, maybe queer people could have a flag too because we are a people. The first rainbow flag he created had eight colors, each with a special meaning. Pink for sexuality, red for life, orange for healing, 
yellow for sunlight, green for nature, blue for art, indigo for harmony, and violet for human spirit. When Baker tried to commercially produce the flag, pink dye was rare and expensive, so the, numbers, or the number of colors on the flag were reduced to seven. It was then reduced to six colors at the Pride Parade honoring the memory of Harvey Milk, three colors to line each side of the street. Since the 1970s, additional colors have been added here and there. During the 1980s, a black stripe was added for victims of AIDS. It was called the Victory Over AIDS flag. In 2017, black and brown stripes were added for people of color. And in 2019, white, pink, and light blue stripes were added for transgender people. When he created the flag in 1978, Gilbert Baker had help from several volunteers who filled trash cans with dye in the attic of the Gay Community Center in San Francisco, and they pieced together the first colored strips. It was unveiled on June 25, 1978. When I saw it on the street, said Baker, I knew it was going to be important. I knew instantly when I saw the reaction that it was going to be something. And then, he said, I walked into Paramount Flag Company, a little flag company in San Francisco in platform shoes and pink hair, and I said, I have a flag and I think you ought to take a look at it. And at first they were like, gay flag? And I was like, oh, it's going to be big. And then, lo and behold, they backed it and started mass producing it. The rainbow, said Baker, is so perfect because it symbolizes diversity in terms of race, gender, ages, all of those things. Plus, he said, it's a natural flag. It's from the sky. This past Wednesday, USA Today reported that the original rainbow flag that Baker created had been recovered and authenticated, and it now hangs in a museum in San Francisco. It was birthed in trash cans filled with dye in an attic, grew in popularity, and is now visible across the globe. It's the kind of seed to tree growth that Jesus spoke about in today's gospel reading. Jesus tells two parables in today's reading from Mark's gospel, and both of them are about the so-called kingdom of God. The phrase kingdom of God is a clunky expression that doesn't translate well to our time because it brings to mind images of thrones and throne rooms, castles and castle walls, knights and maybe even dragons, and regal figures in purple robes and wearing crowns. But Jesus had something less spatial and medieval in mind when he first used the phrase. Jesus once said, the kingdom of God is within you. It's something we carry inside of us. St. Paul in the New Testament described the kingdom of God with words like justice, peace, and joy. Ideas and hopes and values that we carry within and spread to others. These things start small, says Jesus, like little seedlings within. And they grow and spread like pebbles tossed into water. And they become movements that ripple outward and make change. The fire for justice that burns within, the love of peace, the longing for joy, these blossom and spread like seeds on earth, from trash cans filled with dye to global movements of diversity and acceptance, seeds to trees. I can go to another country anywhere in the world, Gilbert Baker once said, and if I see a rainbow flag, I feel like that's someone who is a kindred spirit. That's a safe place for me to go, whether it's a business or a restaurant, a school, or a church. Yes, church should be added to that list of spaces because too many, as you know, in Christian history and still too many today, wield Christianity for purposes of hate and division, trying, in the words of Richard Rohr, to tell God whom to love or not love. Churches, said Reverend Cameron Trimble, shouldn't tell God whom to love. Instead, churches, she said, should be schools of love, little rainbow seedlings of God's kingdom where justice and peace and joy and acceptance 
and inclusion can grow and flourish and blossom and spread from seeds to forests. Writer and activist Guthrie Graves Fitzsimmons has written recently about the moment he stumbled upon one of the most progressive churches in New York City, a church known for its rainbows and for spreading seedlings of love. One morning during my final year at Union Theological Seminary, he writes, I walked past the Church of the Village. It's part of the United Methodist Church and known as one of the most progressive churches in the city. On this particular morning, he remembers, while walking through Greenwich Village, I saw a plaque on the wall of the Church of the Village. It was a city historical marker, noting that the church was the original meeting place of parents and friends of lesbians and gays, PFLAG, on March 11, 1973. As I saw the sign, he says, in Methodist terminology, my heart was, quote, strangely warmed. PFLAG, he continues, wasn't the only early rights movement that had Christian links in Lower Manhattan. From the very beginning of the Stonewall riots, churches stepped up and joined the protests. The Church of the Holy Apostles in Chelsea, part of the Episcopal Church, was from 1969 to 1974 one of the most important meeting places in New York City for organizations fighting for justice. This fact might be surprising to many, he says, because any random person on the street could tell you that the word Christian today does not bring to mind solidarity with the Stonewall riots and crusading for human rights. And yet, he notes, it was Christian churches who helped to spread the rainbow seeds of love that still flourish today. From small meetings in church basements to global movements of God's kingdom, from seeds to trees to forests. There are so many ways to talk about church, about how church can be a seedbed for change. But I love how St. Paul talks about church in today's reading from 2 Corinthians. Paul writes that the church is a place of new creation, a place of renewal and embrace. It's a place of reconciliation, he says. The Greek term Paul uses is a fix-it word, a healing word. The church is a place where people experience the seeds of healing and forgiveness and acceptance without judgment, reconciliation with themselves and others, and then spread these seedlings of grace to others outside our walls, seeds to trees. It's often been said that church is not perfect. It's practice. It's the place, said one pastor, where we practice living the reality we wish to see in the world. We wish to see a world that's more loving. And so we practice love here, a little school of love. We wish to see a world that's more peaceful. And so we practice peacemaking here. We wish to see a world that's more just, and so justice work starts here. We wish to see a world that's more compassionate, and so we practice compassion inside our walls. We wish to see a world that's more colorful and filled with song, and so we fill our spaces with art and music. And we wish to see a world that's more accepting and affirming of people. And so we practice creating a safe space where all of God's children can blossom and flourish, a place people can trust. Which reminds me of a story told by Episcopal priest Tish Harrison Warren. When my eldest daughter was very little, she says, she would get stuck on certain questions. She'd ask the same thing for weeks, sometimes months, over and over again. Her dad and I would try to answer her patiently as we could for the 11 billionth time. There are two questions she asked over and over. First, around age two or three, four months, she'd ask, what's your first name? Her dad would answer, Jonathan. What's your middle name? Edward. Edward, she'd reply, as if this was new and interesting information that she hadn't already heard about three times that morning. No, not Edward, Edward, he'd remind her. Then she'd continue, what's your last name? 
She'd ask all of us, me, Jonathan, strangers, anyone who was willing to tell her their full name, and she'd ask as many times as possible. Eventually, thank God, she stopped with that question. Years later, a different question bubbled up. Mama, do you love me? Daddy, do you love me? She was a little older now and knew that she was asking a lot. She admitted so. She'd say, I'm sorry I'm asking again. But she needed to hear the answer again and again. She didn't ask because we hadn't told her that we loved her, but because it's so easy to doubt it, to question whether it's true, to forget, to wonder whether the answer can be trusted. We all need to hear it over and over again, writes Warren. I come to church and I come to God again and again, she says, with all kinds of questions. But all of them in one way or another, she writes, boil down to the two questions my daughter has asked me thousands of times. What is your name and do you love me? My constant questions to the church and to God, she says, are what are you like? Can you be trusted? Are you good? And I ask, do you love me? Over and over, will you tell me once more? Church isn't perfect. It's practice for living the loving reality we wish to see in the world. It's the place where we tell ourselves over and over that we're loved. The place we sow rainbow seedlings that can sprout and spread and become forests of justice and peace and love and grace and healing. And so let me close this morning with one example of this. It's a local example. Yesterday was the five-year anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. Back in June of 2017, several communities of faith here in Ithaca, including our church, joined together for an interfaith pride service on the one-year anniversary of the Pulse shooting. And we continued to gather each June before the pandemic. It was a way for us to sow little seeds of inclusive healing in our community. Ithaca was not the only town to do this. Faith groups from Boston to Denver to San Francisco did something similar, little seedlings of hope scattered across the country. We can't know for sure what national impact there was from this, but I like to think we made a difference. Because on Thursday, according to NBC News, the U.S. Senate unanimously passed legislation to designate the site of the Pulse shooting as a national memorial. The House of Representatives passed its version of this on May 12th. One survivor of the 2016 attack, Brandon Wolf, thanked members of Congress for, quote, recognizing our hollowed ground by naming the site a national memorial. Pulse nightclub itself posted on its Facebook page, quote, the unanimous consent in the U.S. Senate is such welcome news as we set to mark the five-year remembrance of the Pulse tragedy. This recognition from both the House and Senate means so much to our community. Pulse included a hashtag with the post, we will not let hate win. Given the divisiveness of the U.S. Senate, who would have thought that it would pass such a bill by unanimous consent? Seeds to trees, from trash cans filled with dye in San Francisco attics, from small meetings in church basements in Greenwich Village, from interfaith communities coming together for healing, to movements that make the world a little better for everyone, from seeds to rainbow forests. The promise Jesus makes in today's gospel reading is that our little seedlings will grow. If what we plant is loving, if what we practice inside our church walls is motivated by love, God will be in the midst of it, turning our tiny seeds into something beautiful. Amen.
Please be seated. As always, we want to share our joys and concerns with each other. If you have a prayer for the emailed prayer tree, please send it to me, Susan Fast, using the email address on page two of the bulletin. It will be included in the next emailed prayer cares. At the end of the litany prayer today, I will invite you to say aloud the name or names of those who are on your heart, all at the same time. And as part of our prayer time this morning, and part of our healing theme, Haley Sullivan will share her personal experience of walking the journey of healing. When Haley is finished, we will end our prayer time with the Lord's Prayer. Today's prayer is modified from one written by Reverend Dr. Frederick Streets of Yale Divinity School. And after the, each of the following segments, I'll say we pray to God, and you may respond with, Hear us, O God. Let us pray. Caring God, we trust that we will laugh again without caution. We will smile again without constraint. We will embrace again without defense. We will speak again without muted sounds. We pray to God, hear us, O God. Divine companion, we trust that. We will again, side by side, look at the stars. We will gather in places and spaces unsoiled by our anxiety and fear. We will breathe deeply again. We will dance again with our cheeks close enough to hear the whisper of, to one another. We pray to God. Hear us, O oh God. Loving parent, we trust that we will greet each other again closely without suspicion. Children will hug us again, and we will hug children again. We will invite solitude again, and we will mourn openly again. We pray to God. Hear us, O oh God. God of all hope. We trust that we will imagine again without desperation. We will again feel the joy that hope brings. We will play together again. We will sing together again. We pray to God. Hear us, O oh God. God who strengthens us, we trust that we will cheer together again. We will pray together again. We will feel each other's hands and arms again tomorrow. Tomorrow again. So let us now share aloud the names of those who are on our hearts today, all at the same time. Wen Lu. David, Jasmine, O oh, compassionate God, hear our prayers, answer them according to your will, and make us channels of your infinite grace. Through Jesus Christ, we pray.
In looking back at the past 15 months, I'm able to have a new perspective on what has happened. Granted, there were many losses and missed opportunities. The first event in my life impacted by COVID was an art trip to Europe scheduled for spring break of 2020. This trip had been in the works for two years and several of my friends and classmates and I were going to have the time of our lives in Europe with some of our favorite teachers as chaperones. We were going to go to Italy and France, visit museums, go shopping, eat amazing food and explore. However, once the, pan once the pandemic hit Italy pretty severely, our destinations were changed to London and France. I think we all knew that the likelihood of this trip actually happening was slim. So when we received the news that our superintendent, from our superintendent that the trip was canceled, it didn't come as a complete shock. The only way I could handle the disappointment of that was by going on with my life and not thinking about what my friends and I had missed out on. My senior high school musical was also cut short. Our director, our director Cindy Howell, came on stage after the Friday night performance and announced that we wouldn't be allowed to do the final performance on Saturday because school would be going virtual. This was the last of my high school musical performances. The rest of the cast and I hugged and cried on the stage as the curtains closed on us one last time. The next day, we took down the sets and had a little cast party in the lobby of the auditorium. When it was all over, we said goodbye, unsure of when we would be able to see each other again. After the announcement that school was going to be online, I was hopeful that I would be able to go back at some point and say goodbye to my teachers, friends, and classmates. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. I had already had my last day of high school, and I didn't know it at the time. We didn't have our senior prom, senior trip, or senior breakfast. We never even got the chance to have our teachers and friends sign our yearbooks. As for online school, it became more and more difficult to stay focused and motivated. I would have to replay a video because I zoned out and wasn't paying attention. I missed the sense of community I got from in-person school. I looked forward to the Zoom meetings I had every week for school because it felt comforting to hear and see some of my classmates and teachers, as well as have some social interaction. Like many others, I craved social interaction. I found myself missing everything and everyone. I missed my friends and my dance class. I missed my teachers and my relatives. I missed going to church. However, one person who really helped me feel connected and less isolated was Anna Sanas. She did a fantastic job of keeping the children and youth connected, even though we weren't all in the same time zone. Our church Zoom meetings gave me comfort and allowed me space to share how I was doing or to distract me from my anxieties. It was so refreshing to play fun games and chat with my friends from church. Despite all of the negative outcomes and disappointments I have experienced due to the pandemic, I have been able to find several silver linings. When it became clear that the pandemic was going to get much worse and that we weren't going back to school for the rest of the year, I made a decision to defer starting college for a year. At this point, I hadn't even decided which college I wanted to attend. <laughs> I finally decided on Elmira College because of its small size and tight-knit community on campus. I put down my deposit and asked for a deferment for a year. I was offered an internship through the United Way, but due to COVID concerns, I had to turn it down. I was able to get a job working at Myers Park last summer which felt safe to me because I was working outside and alone. As a family, we were able to take more walks together during breaks throughout the day, which have helped us to refocus and reset for the afternoon. I'm also really happy that I was able to continue babysitting for another year for the Baker family. I got to continue taking dance classes for another year. It was hard for me because I was the only one who wasn't in person. Once I got vaccinated, I was able to go back to class in person 
and it was wonderful to see my friends and teacher again. During my gap year, I took a few classes online through TC3, which will lighten my load at Elmira in the fall. At last, but certainly not least, I was able to attend church, along with youth gatherings for another year. If there's anything I've learned from this pandemic, it's these three things. One, you should never take anything for granted. Two, the best way to get through hard times is to look for the positives. And three, stay connected to friends and family. Thank you for letting me share my healing journey. Thank you, Haley. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And may we all experience peace and healing. And now in response to God's healing grace, we share our gifts. If you brought a gift with you this morning, the offering plates are located at the back of the sanctuary. And if you're giving from the virtual world, just click on the uh, giving link in the YouTube chat window.
us pray. Healing God, we are thankful that you are with us and within us, behind us and before us, beside us, to comfort and restore us. Amen. may God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up her countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>